We can kick off here. So uh, welcome to the New England Vintage Electronics Club, August 6th, Zoom Spectacular. So the summer of Zooms, good Zooms, continues. We've had some great shows. Yes, and tonight, Mr. David Crew is going to grace us with a presentation on Philco Radio, and I believe focusing on post-war. So uh, just some information about Philco. I mean, everybody, I mean, it's one of those brands that's right up there with Zenith. So um, I have this nifty little book that somehow got its way into my hands. It's from the RCA Laboratories Division. Do not remove from laboratory. Gee, I wonder who removed it. Anyway, so it has some interesting statistics, though. They cover lots of different aspects of early radio. So in 1940, here's a question, here's a quiz. We'll start with a question for all of you. Who do you think was the leading manufacturer of uh, consumer sets in 1940? Throw it a name. Philco, I think. Philco? Yeah. Well, Philco was edged by RCA, actually. At, uh, yes, RCA. RCA had 1,700,000, and the author quotes, you know, these figures are the best he could compile based on what was available to him. And it is an old book, so I don't think he could Google it. Philco came in at 1,000,000, <coughs> excuse me, 675,000, and Zenith was just about a million, 1,050,000. Emerson was at the same 1,050,000. Galvin, which we know is Motorola, came in at just under a million, and then the list drops off, you know, pretty pretty dramatically there. So, I mean, Philco was right up there. Uh, and I'm sure there were some years in the 30s when they were ahead of RCA because they made some great stuff. And they had a little bit of everything, big sets, little sets, everything in between. They marketed well. And the stuff was pretty good. I know a lot of collectors who, you know, if you don't want to talk to them about 30s Philco, they really don't want to talk to you about any other radio. So it's a great band, brand with a great legacy and started out as a, storage battery company and you know went on and I believe finally folded up probably around 1960-61 they sold off to I think Ford the division of Ford Motors and, and that was it for Philco though somebody has reported that there are a couple of brands they see down in uh, South America strangely enough somebody must have bought the name and they I put them on some of the big box door TVs so anyway, without further ado, off we go to David. Thanks for coming on and, and sharing your story tonight. We, we look okay. forward to it. Thank you, David, for coming. No, my pleasure. Somebody needs to, whoever the host is, needs to enable oh. my ability to share a screen. Oh, sure. Not a problem. Let's go. Let's go get that squared away. Okay. All right, my friend. You should All right. There we go. I'm just going <laughs> to share everything. So let me see if I can do this. Okay, so, all right, gentlemen, welcome to, let me get this, welcome to Philco Night at Nevik. And tonight we're going to be talking about Philco and state of the art. So as some of you know, I work at analog devices. I'm in the marketing department. We use that expression all the time, state of the art, which for some people means all about technology. But in the case, especially of some antique radio brands, it's also about as much about the art as it is about, about the technology. Um, so, as, uh, as Paul mentioned, Philco started out as the Helios Electric Company, and they made batteries for then the telephone, and I think, could everybody mute, because I'm hearing some yeah. voices in the Yeah, I'll see if I can fix that. Thank you. Uh, the Helios Battery Company, and they made batteries for telephone and telegraph systems. By 1906, as the growing automotive market motivated the the company to change their name and start marketing for automobiles. By 1919, they changed their name to the Philco Battery Company, and we're still marketing mostly to automotive. But as the 1920s moved on and radio became more popular, they began marketing A, B, and C batteries. In 1926, Philco decided to move into the manufacture of radios themselves. To show you how much effort they put into it, it took them three years before they finally released their first series of radios, beginning with the beautiful Lowboy series. 
And throughout the 30s, Philco was at the forefront of some of those beautiful designed radios, floor models, tombstones, tabletops, uh, Bakelite, wood, and you could even see a portable uh, leather covered battery version. Philco was at the forefront of technological advances. This is the first consumer remote ever, re ever produced. And I'm hearing myself now being echoed. It's the Philco mystery remote. How it worked uh, really was a mystery to most of the public. It was a beautiful concept that you could pick up this object and not have it wired to anything. And it would turn on and off, raise or lower the volume, or change the radio station to any one of the six presets on these Philco console floor models. It's a pretty basic circuit. It's a, it's a 30 tube with some capacitors. Uh, obviously, you can see the transmit coil. And what it did was, since the public was so used to dial telephones, you simply dialed in the setting and the pulses would be picked up by the floor model and it would either, again, on, off, volume up or down or change the station. About a year later, Philco came up with another amazing innovation. Now, I, I, I want to point out, I don't have, I have the remote, but I don't have any of the consoles. I have on my iPhone a list of the Philco models that will work with a mystery remote, and that's on my bucket list. So someday I, I'd hope to find one of those radios. I did find this radio. Um, being collectors, I know we all love the story of the hunt. I saw this radio advertised on Facebook Marketplace back in January before the world went to crap. And the guy said, I'm cleaning out my parents' attic, you know, 50 bucks for this radio. So I said, well, would you take 40? And um, amazingly, he said, sure, just come and take this thing out of my house. And so I brought it home. Couldn't wait to dig into it because I love floor models. It had the AM, some shortwave bands, and it had a turntable. But when I pulled open the turntable part, I found something really strange. At the end of the arm, instead of finding either a ceramic or a crystal cartridge and a needle, I found this contraption. And I did a little research and I quickly found out that what I had inadvertently bought for on the cheap, frankly, was a Philco beam of light turntable. The marketing folks really went to town on this. They talked about, first of all, those nasty old steel needles and how they would destroy your 78 records. And they, I love the copy here, the rounded jewel that floats gently over the record grooves. And of course, it looks like a whole bunch of marketing hype, but in fact, uh, to Philco's credit, this really is pretty much how the device works. And so, we're, again, I, I love this confluence of art and science. And one of the things they wanted to do, and you can argue whether or not it's the art or the science, is we all know that as, as good as these rectifiers, these AC to DC rectifiers were in these floor models, there was always that nagging little a AC hum that you'd get in, in, in our radios and even in the turntable playback. So what they wanted to do was build a device that would isolate the turntable arm, the pickup from the rest of the circuit. And this is how they did it. So this light source, pretty bright bulb would reflect off of this pivoting mirror. And as you can see in the diagram provided by Philco, it really does have a little sapphire needle that is connected to this armature. And as the needle vibrated inside the grooves of the record, our pivoting mirror would reflect onto a selenium photovoltaic cell. What could be cooler than that? I mean, photovoltaic cells have been around since 1883, but 
they really were beginning to become more publicly known as uh, automatic door openers, which again, you know, how futuristic is that? And that was starting to be seen in public. And so um, I want to show you how this circuit works and how they, they, they went out of their way to, uh, as I say, I'm using the word isolate. Uh, I think they used a, a different expression, but here's the, Here's the pickup device. Here's that beam of light contraption, which, which energizes the light bulb, not directly from the power supply, but it picks it off, off induction from the radio's LO oscillator. There's the beam of light pickup contraption over here. You can see uh, it leads through a shielded cable to this small transformer. It does a little bit of boosting of the signal. It's also where if you wanted to, you could plug in a microphone because one other thing this radio phonograph has is a record arm. Um, it's, I think it's interesting to note that of all the collectors that I've spoken to who have the beam of light and have the record cutter, none of us have gotten the record cutter working. We just, we're just so happy to have the beam of light thing working. The problem of course, is this selenium pickup. This thing is 80 years old and it's absolutely useless at this point. It's, it doesn't generate any voltage at all. So how do you replace that big slab of selenium, the photovoltaic cell? So through, um, a contact I made on radioforum.com. This guy who found um, a bunch of surplus dollar bill changers. And inside these old dollar and five dollar bill changers is a little photo diode. And he sold me one of them, bless his heart. And as he predicted, this exact photovoltaic cell just snaps into place. When you close the cover that uh, protected or, or uh, held in the original selenium cell, it just, it snapped into place. And because this is a much more efficient photodiode, it doesn't have to be as large as the original one was. It did require a little tightening up of the beam. And what I'm gonna do now is show you that they also designed this stunning clamshell cover. Because it's using light and you're gonna have the turntable pulled out to put your records into place, you needed to prevent ambient light from hitting that photo sensor. And so they built this little clamshell device. What I wanna do now is play for you, but I'm gonna to have to, give me just a second while I share Whoops, hold on. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, now I'm gonna turn the light out. Oh. I mean, come on. Wow. That is awesome. Yeah, it's... So I, I just, you know, uh, I, I can't tell you the feeling I got the first time I heard music coming from this because it just sounded fantastic. Whoops, didn't mean to stop the sharing. Sure. Let me go back and share my PowerPoint slide. So I'll click that and click that. And there we go. So Again, my, I, I'm, I'm clearly a fan. Uh, I, I, I love Philco. I, I love the attention both to the technical details and to the artistry of the, the cabinets and the cases in which they put some of this tech. And so Philco looked poised to do even more remarkable things. And then America got involved in the war right after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. Almost all major manufacturers, including a lot of medium and small manufacturers, immediately were either, uh, either volunteered or some were conscripted to turn their attention towards defense work. 
and Filco was one of the many companies that provided uh, defense products that eventually helped America win the war three and a half, four years later. So all those soldiers, sailors, Marines, CBs, pilots, wax waves, they're all coming home to one of the great expansive economies that the world has ever seen. And now it's time to go out and start buying more stuff because America is just exploding with new products and new technologies. Philco went back to producing consumer radios. One of the first models they produced was the 46-250, beautiful tabletop Bakelite pieces. Now, these two radios look exactly the same, but in fact, they're not. When I finally got around to actually working on them, and don't ask me why I bought two radios that looked exactly the same, I probably thought, oh, I'll fix one and sell it. But I found out they had two different stickers. One was a code 122 and one was a code 125. So that began another set of researching and asking questions and going on sites. And I found out that there was not only two versions of the 46250, but there was actually one that came out almost as soon as Philco went back into the consumer products. I never did find a 121. There's a couple of guys I know who have it. This is um, the model 121 and what it has is an electromagnetic speaker along with um, uh, the complement of tubes, the five tubes. So it's interesting, an electromagnetic speaker, which you know, I, I, I've always thought it was so damn clever, whoever it was that realized, huh, that electromagnet, which is driving the speaker, is also perfect for our Pi network rectifier. And I just think that was always the cleverest thing. So. A lot of floor models uh, and tabletops in the 30s had it. And the first radios that came out from Philco after the war had it as well. Philco also had the 56L6 audio amplifier and a 35Z5 rectifier, both of which were Bakelite octal tubes. And they also had one bit of, I'll call it high tech, Loctal tubes. We're all familiar with the Loctal tubes with the aluminum base, made them a little lighter, a little cheaper to manufacture. The pins coming from the vacuum tube directly out through the glass envelope. Allegedly, they locked into place. I think we all know what a load of crap that is. These things wobble like crazy. Um, they're supposed to also be pin compatible. They do fit into octal sockets, but most of the circuitry in most Loctals is not exactly the same as its predecessor in Bakelite. So there's always a little bit of retooling, uh, reorganizing underneath the, um, in the chassis that has to be done. And in fact, that's what does have to be done as we move into the next phase of the Philco uh, series of the 46250s. First, we replace the electromagnet with a permanent magnet. It makes the uh, radios a little cheaper to manufacture, actually probably a lot cheaper, uh, generates a little less heat, but it's still using our 50L6 and our 35Z5 octal tubes. And everything is just humming along great in the old Philco factory and people are buying up the 122s and everything's going great. When all of a sudden they get a panic call from the stock room, um, guys were running out of 35Z5s and 50 L6s. So rather than order more of these old fashioned Bakelite tubes, what they did was they replaced the 35Z5 rectifier with a Loctal 35Y4. But then what they did with the amplifier, instead of going with a Loctal, they went with an even newer type of tube, the miniature tube. The miniature tube, much like the Loctal, has the pins that exit directly out through the glass um, envelope into the pins. Um, I don't know, uh, I'd say this, these mini tubes, they are very hot. Um, 
So it's a good thing they were put inside Bakelite cases, Bakelite being famous for being temperature resistant. One thing about the 50B5, and this is, you know, when you think about a manufacturer who has to make a business decision to replace one type of tube with another type of tube, is it going to be cost effective, especially when you have to take that uh, hole into which you've punched a large hole in your chassis and you have to rivet in a smaller socket for that miniature tube. But that's exactly what Philco did and the code 125 tube uh, radio, which has the 50 B5 mini tube sold extremely well. The 46250 was not the only radio from the Philco series that migrated or evolved. The Hippo, famous Hippos, known for those Hippo smiles of those radios, they started with the 121. They eventually replaced the audio octal tube with the mini tube. And then they would also replace the rectifier with its loctal companion. So as we move into the 50s, Philco continued to look to modernize. And with the, um, the perfection of plastic processing, remember, always been plastics, plastics. Philco was able to produce colored radios in much more interesting designs because plastic is much more um, malleable and can be formed much easier and cheaper than Bakelite. As Philco evolved and continued to do state-of-the-art, eventually, of course, they started producing radios with transistors in them. What I love about the old transistor ads is they would make it a point of telling you how many transistors were in the radio. In this case, a three transistor radio, it's pretty neat. As we move into the 60s, because FM is starting to encroach onto the market, they started producing radios first with mono FM and then with stereo FM. And as Paul indicated earlier, we did, and there's your, your all transistor marker on there. Uh, the Philco Corporation in the, I think it was 1966, was purchased by the Ford company. Philco had already been producing car radios for Ford. Now, once Ford had that brand, they started producing all sorts of consumer products, including one of the most highly regarded refrigerators on the market in the 1960s. The Philco uh, Ford brand was bought by GTE. Then it was bought by the Swedish company Electrolux. Then it was bought by Philips. And as Paul said, there is some branding down in South America and certain European countries with the Philco brand, which got resurrected in the 1980s. So there you go, gentlemen. That is my look back at the Philco Corporation and their state-of-the-art technology and production. Uh, I'll take any questions, and if you are looking for anything specific, there's my email address, my ham radio call sign, wb2hto at comcast.net. <coughs> so yeah, great. I'm going to stop sharing. How do I stop? Or can you oh, turn I, can, me... I can do that for you if you want. Oh, wait a minute. Stop sharing. That's what the button says. <laughs> well, thank you, David. That was uh, illuminating, to say thank the least. Thank you. So, thank you. You know, one thing I'd throw in, and I don't know if it had anything to do with the tube configurations, though I know anybody who's ever looked, especially at things like Emerson's, you know, have found those mixtures of the old style oh. locals with the mini tubes. In, uh, I believe it was just about 1940, 41, when the beam of light came out, Philco obtained a controlling interest in National Union, which was a big tube manufacturer. Oh. So I don't know if that gave them an edge as far as, you know, being willing to get, you know, such fantastic prices on tubes that they could re-engineer a chassis or a circuit. And then one other little tidbit I'll add in here before we, uh, before we open things up. During World War II, Philco not only produced radio and electrical equipment for tanks and aircraft, but also for items such as Fuses for artillery shells, aerial bombs, and the bazooka rocket projectile. The company also operated a school for training military personnel to install, operate, and maintain 
airborne electronic equipment. Philco received 21 Army Navy E flags during the war, which were awarded um, on the basis of efficiency in meeting their production quotas. So, you know, not so, only a great company for the consumer, but, mm. you know, did a great, great deal, you know, as far as doing their part for Uncle Sam as well. Yeah. So, I, hats um, off to Philco. Yeah. I, I just finished a terrific book about um, Harley Earl, who was the man who was credited with designing fins into cars in the 1950s. And it talks about, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, Philco making bazookas so well, bazooka could, fuses apparently bazooka for, the, fuses. for the projectiles so I, but but well, nevertheless I think, I, I think we could understand that it's obviously it's it's a it's a step but if you're making cars to making tanks is one thing but to go from making radios to bazooka fuses that's that's a pretty to me that's that's a real sign of agility in a manufacturer yes, and, yes. Uh, and, so and not to mention that, the fact that the 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 talent and the quality of the engineering departments and you you know the drive i'm sure yes. they weren't punching out at five o'clock every night either yeah. and uh to meet or exceed your production uh quotas i'm sure they were uh, aggressive to say the least <laughs> but it, it was the same for zenith it was the same for rca mm. they uh pumped out you know thousands upon thousands of things and if you look at some of those tubes that you see the vt tubes that were all you know produced during the war or you ever get mm -hmm. surplus tubes you know so you can imagine if there's that many left over well how many did they make in the first place you know yeah. so you know it, it, it's it's you know prolific uh, manufacturing to say the least so yes yeah well no it's it, it listen we went from being what do they say the 18th largest army in 1940 to beating two different armies. So, you know, the sleeping giant. The ramp the sleeping up. sleeping giant. Just, yeah, it was amazing. Yes, right. Yamamoto is a great quote. Any any questions, comments for Mr. Crew this evening, uh, gentlemen? Well, I, <clears throat> I have a little routine tribute to Philco. It seems that my wife takes a sleeping pill every night called <clears throat> Trazodone. So every night I say, here is your transitone. <laughs> Very cute. A little play on words. That's, that's, that's a good one. I, I see you You left out the uh, discussion about, whoop, I got feedback here of some kind, um, about the Philco predictors. They weren't exactly a technological marvel. <laughs> I don't, I'm not familiar with them. Tell me about them. The, the television sets? Oh, television. That new fad that's never going to catch on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, it's funny. I, I, yeah, I know. I didn't even talk about the TVs. You're right. Philco, along with refrigerators and ice chests and things, they, they did produce some TVs. Pretty good you know, ones, not, too. Not, not long ago, um, I was in the <clears throat> lobby area at, <clears throat> excuse me, at WBZ over in Boston, and oh. they had... Uh, a beautiful uh, Victor uh, radio, which is probably shortly before RCA and, and Victor uh, uh, merged up. But they also had a very nice Predicta. Um, again, you know, very mm -hmm. typical 50s type set, you know, on yeah. display in the lobby. And I had asked the fellow over there, I said, do, do, do any of this stuff play? And he's, oh, no, I didn't play. So have you, have you ever thought about, you know, having your on-air program come through this, you know, fine Victor or your, wow. to watch the 11 o'clock news on the Predicta? But, um, you know, the, I think it was the design for the predictor as much as anything else, you know, very futuristic and uh, very 50s. And they came in a, a pretty neat range of colors as well. But every now and then you do see them around. Yeah. Cool I, to look at. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, guys. Always fun to, uh, to do these things. No, that was great, Dave. That was really, truly uh, a nice, yeah, uh, nice right. summary. Maybe, we, uh, Paul, we could just, you know, go through the go through the attendee list and uh, just uh, if anyone has a Pilco show and tell. Yeah. I know Certainly. Something. Certainly. <laughs> Who wouldn't have a Philco for us to, to show and tell with? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go first so then I can you know, go through the group here. I don't have a radio, though. I did pick up a very nifty little uh, PT-25 that I'll dig out and show some night. But um, anybody who's interested in learning more about Philco, you can listen to David, but you could also pick up this 
book that yep. you can still find around. Yeah. Philco Radios and more. It's uh, written by uh, Ron Ramirez out in Indiana. So it covers Philco from 1928 up through 1942. A lot of good history, a lot of information on not only cabinet design, but the company itself. It has two layouts in the back. Uh, lots of interesting stuff. So uh, uh, excellent photographs. And some, uh, you know, he'll go through the line with each model year, how many were produced, what colors. Uh, it's a really neat, uh, really neat book to have if you're a collector. A lot of advertisements, you know, so a lot of vintage photographs of, from magazine ads and the like. And also he maintains a pretty nifty website if you ever found yourself stuck on a Philco and somebody from Never couldn't help you out with a question. Uh, the Philco Forum is a meeting place online for folks who specialize in repair and restoration for Philcos and swapping parts if you ever got stuck. So well worth checking out. That's uh, Philco Forum, and that's P-H-O-R-U-M. Yeah. So, okay, so let's see. Who has something from Philco that would like to show us here? We'll go through the list here. Mr. Pereira, do you have anything in your Philco bag of tricks? Not tonight? Not tonight, thank you. All right, okay, very good. Mr. Harris, how are you this evening? Yeah, I'll just make a quick comment. Um, first of all, thanks for a great presentation. It's really good. Uh, I was really very interested to see your 46 250. Uh, I've got a 48 250. It's a 48 250 code 126. I'd showed it here a couple of weeks ago. It's the one in the acrylic case. And, and I was, I could hold it up now. I don't think you'll see it very well. I've got my virtual background on. I'm actually not in Hawaii. Um, but I, I was really interested in particularly in your discussion about the tubes. So I looked at mine, it's got the 50 B6 miniature tube mm -hmm. and the other tubes in this 48 250 are the, uh, the ones with the aluminum base. So yeah. I, just, I hadn't known about the 46 and the 48. I think the 46 means it was um, made in 1946. Yes. And my understanding was the 48 was made in 1948. Mm-hmm. So thank you. It was really great. Oh, no, you're it. welcome. Thank you. That, that's all I got to say. How about Len? How are you this evening, Len? Do you have a Philco you'd like to show us or a comment? Yeah, I do. And actually, a question, too. I'll try to flip my camera. So you see that little speed bulletin thing there? Oh, yeah. Man. So I'm not sure if it's a speaker or a microphone. In some <laughs> My guess would be a speaker. Depends on where you plug it in. <laughs> it has kind of a strange plug. Hmm. Well, see, your hand now gives it a certain scale. I thought it was quite a bit larger than that one, but yeah, that very well could hmm. be a microphone then. Yeah. It, can, you, can you take it apart and see if, um, you know, uh, perhaps it's a ribbon microphone that you know be if we could see the structure of what's inside that container that yeah, that's tell us. Yeah, i've never taken it apart but i yeah. will that's a good idea that, that that'll, I, that'll tell you what before. it is yeah and and they, they were microphones used on the record cutter okay i mean i was wondering that when they, they were showing the record cutter yeah yeah so maybe I'm, nice I'm find saying, picture of the plug and then you have the record cutter, right? Maybe you can see if there is a, uh, and then hey, you know what? It. You're right. That plug looks like it would fit very nicely into that transformer. That's the, basically a coupling transformer that takes the input from the beam of light or from the microphone. Yeah, that's okay. what that is. Son of a gun. So I've I'm had it. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to say that is uh now what is that marking up on the top? Oh, it's, it just says Philco. I Philco. just want to see in there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, back as the little on off switch. Oh, that's very cool. That's got to be the microphone because the on off switch I think gives it away when you're playing off the phonograph, you don't want the microphone mm. You know, on top audio on top of that. That's that's terrific, man. That's nice. And then I also have a Philco Predictor TV, but I didn't carry it up here. <laughs> Found the basement. 
Well, and it sounds like you and David have to get together when all of this distancing and uh, travel restriction stuff ends and see if you can put that to use. Yeah, well, I get, that means I got to get the cutter to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a challenge. Yeah, I've got a cutter already. I've got a, a true tone where I've got the record cutter working. It's Very cute, nice. but it's, yeah. it's like <laughs> good luck finding blank records. That's, I, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> So let's see here. We continue to go around the group. Thank you, Len. Uh, Mr. Gibbons, do you have anything to throw in the pot this evening? Sadly, no. I don't have any Philco radios, although I'd like to have one. But I, I admittedly, those who know me, have, I have a lot of uh, German radios in my collection. But uh, I, I need to get a Philco because I'm quite fond of them. I need to have a couple of Americans. So I'll be, I enjoyed this presentation just to uh, learn a little bit more about, uh, about their history and some of their models. So I will continue to... Uh, Looking to maybe getting one one day. No Philco Funkins yet on your shelf. <laughs> when they first should be together. <laughs> I like. It. Yes, sir, Mr. Devonshire. How are you this evening? Oh, I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, I do have a Philco, but uh, let me uh, present some paper first. Uh, can we see this? How does that look? Oh, oh nice. I'm okay. ready to buy. All right, and then we'll flip it around. And how are we doing here? Very nice. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. So that's number L one. First LP players. I did not. Very good. That. Very good. I did not mention them in you my. You know your Philco's there, David. Good. Well, I was. Right. I was also. So, yeah. Let's yeah. see. Let's bring this back. Can you read this? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. So now that you've seen all that, let me present the M15. Ugh. Nice. Let me open it. Hey, oh, there we go. Very nice. How's that? All original. Very nice. All right. Anybody know if there's supposed to be a panel on the bottom? That's the only thing I'd like to know. Good My question. guess is there would be. Yeah, I would guess there would be. Yeah. Okay, everything's there. Uh, the only thing that's... Um, not original on this is the jack. They put an RCA jack on it. Of horrors. Yeah, there's supposed to be a three pin. Uh, that phonograph was supposed to be mated with the 49909 AM FM radio. Uh, big wooden box inside. And then finally, let me present you with... Hey! Yes. <laughs> there you go. All right. Being right. a member of the Philco Forum, you have to have one of these. <laughs> yeah, yes, but does it plug in? <laughs> Me too. Very nice. As long as you wear it. <clears throat> Excellent. John uh, Noah, how are you? Nozaki. Anything um, to share, to add? Predictors? Yeah, sure. I, hopefully this pops up. Um, I forgot that I had Philco's other than the predicted televisions until I got the invitation, and I recognized the alligator-covered um, Philco another innovation by Philco where it looks like this is where they got the idea of floppy disks from yeah. back in the day. Oh, yeah. Record players where you, you're supposed to not be able to touch anything and just like take the record and, you know, jam it in and, and close up the cover, you know, and then like away you're supposed to go. You know, that's with, with fantastic. What you're be that's I like great. It. That's Very the one cool. that's just the record player. And then they, on the fancier version than that, they did a, um, a version that they called the Bing Crosby because yes. Bing Crosby did the advertising. So that's over here. So that's a little fancier. Again, yeah. you open the door to pop in the record. And when you're done, you open the, the drawer up and the, the tone arm lifts up and swings out of the way and it automatically picks the size, whether it's a 10 or a 12 inch record. And this particular machine is also uh, an AM radio and it has a pretty nice. interesting on off volume control. You can see it says, maybe you can see it says radio oh, yeah. off phono because uh -huh. it's an on off switch that clicks one way to be a volume control when you're playing the phono and it clicks the other way when you're using it as a volume control for the radio. Clever. So off is the center wow. position. So those are two kind of 
innovative Philco record players that I really actually cool. forgot that I actually had until I saw the invitation and I recognized I, my uh, alligator skinned unit. I'd love to see how that volume control works because you're going clockwise to turn up the volume on the radio and counterclockwise to turn up the... Right. Uh, okay. That's kind of neat. I mean, yeah. <laughs> how does it Those do Those Philco that? engineers at work, right? See, Philco once again, guys, a real bear told to you, state of the art. They're amazing. You know, you know, we, we would be remiss if we did not mention, uh, you know, certainly the technical aspects of Philco and the engineering group. Philco was renowned for its sales and marketing division as well. Uh, these were driven guys who got out in the field and they beat the bushes. Mm. Um, they worked with the distributors, something fierce. And um, there is some material and it may be over at the Philco forum. They had some interesting information on how they, their whole marketing effort worked. Uh, what did they do in the different uh, you know, stores that were devoted to Philco? And uh, very interesting you know, marketing side to the stuff because obviously – the uh, engineering was there, and then, well, how do we get these things into people's homes? And some of the stuff was fairly pricey in the 30s, considering, you know, the Great Depression yeah. and what the average income was. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, round and round. And, and the partnership, of course, with Bing Crosby, um, and I believe they hosted, uh, he had a radio hour, I think, that was the Philco radio hour. There was just recently a some music released. Uh, they have live, you know, they took the transcription discs from the uh, Philco shows and put it out uh, to the public. So there was recently a release of some music, uh, Bing Crosby and the, I don't know, Philco Music Hour or Philco Music Hall. So all kinds of nifty aspects to yeah. this stuff. The engineering uh, is pretty uh, weird. To, uh, uh, playing uh, this thing now, I, you could probably hear it. There we go. While it's playing, if you just open up the door, it just picks the tone arm straight up and swings it out of the way so you can reach in and pull the record out so there's no scratching of the record. Very nifty. That is really the nice. The tone like arm. So it probably made a lot of different records last longer from, you know, not having sure. it handled that way and not having tone arms dropped on them. And you do see those every now and then too. It's not as if they're impossible to find. I've seen quite a few. Excellent. Thank you, John. Thank you for sharing that. That was a good demo. Neat. You're hired for the sales and marketing team. You, uh, you hit you hit Akron running on Monday morning. Okay, we want some figures on Tuesday. Door, go door to door with a Mr. Lagur, Mr. Laguri, how are you tonight? Any Philco uh, info no, you would uh, like to share or radios to to share with us? Uh, no, if you can hear me, okay. Let me see. Am I unmuted here? Okay. You know, yes, you are. Thank you, David. Loud and clear. That was, that was very interesting. I did have two or three of those Philco. It's the 461201, the Bing Crosby thing, but uh, just that I found it kind of not too easy that to work on the record player and chassis at the same time. Kind of not too easy to get in and out of that thing. Uh, how do you do it with a record when it's outside the chassis? It doesn't work. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I'm glad that I don't have to work on those again anymore. <laughs> All right, Jim, thanks for joining us tonight. Well, actually, just to answer that question, um, yes, John. if I can turn my thing back on here. It's kind of like working on a car. If you have a couple of couple of buttons that push in here and then the whole lid pops up and you have the, the radio is totally exposed and the turntable is totally exposed. So it's kind of like a flip nose, like working on a, an old British sports car. So it's oh, not yeah. that bad. You just have to know the trick of the two little release catches to hook the whole thing up like that. You have a big point for serviceability. Hey, David, here's a question for you. Any any idea how the Philco dealer network liked working on that beam of light stuff? I mean, that had to be a world changer for them, you know, going from the traditional tone arm with a needle and all. I mean, that must have been just a, imagine going out on a service call for something like that when you were, a tr you know, a traditional, you know, replace the electrolytics, text the tubes and look for burnt out wire that's a that's a great question uh, as you remember from my zenith presentation a few meetings ago you know zenith would put out regular bulletins for field service uh i'd love to see because i being in marketing I'd, I'd love to learn more about the philco marketing effort and also you're right how did you know 
those poor sales guys who or service guys who were used to just replacing a ceramic or crystal cartridge now suddenly have to learn about photovoltaic cells and lining up those mirrors it, it, it's a pain man it was you know i was i couldn't i must have lucked out because i can't believe i got everything aligned and it was you know and it, as you can hear it sounds great that's tough well, it, it, that, that makes up for all the other projects that I'm sure have been uh, the brain teasers over the years as well. So you hit the right one. Yeah, Bruce, how yeah. are you? I'm with Bruce. Oh, I guess I'm the only one tonight. WX10. <laughs> Come yeah, in. WX10. Thank you. 10. I'm sorry. Yeah, I do have some things that I'd like to show, and I'll see if I can do that. Let's see if I can uh, move out of the way. Not sure if I can move my, I'll have to move the radios closer. I see it already. Lighted sign. You're over here for a minute. Huh? Time to have a little bit here of Here is a, uh, here's what I've learned to, to be known as a type 59C. <clears throat> Trying to re reduce the glare. And uh, apparently in 1934, it's a four-tube superhead. And it has a burl pattern on the front of the, let me see if I can get closer, has a burl pattern on the front of it, but that's not real wood. That's a photograph that they've incorporated to, uh, to make it look like wood. Hmm. So I got this, from a, got this from a family member. I've never even plugged it in. Uh, it's missing the rear cover, but it's a it's a nice shelf uh, shelf exhibit. Mantle set, like the marquetry. Yeah, that, that's one thing. Then uh, some years ago, I picked up this little P uh, PT twenty five, and uh, according to uh, looking at transitone, looking at the um, let me, see, let me turn some light around, maybe. Uh, looking at some literature on the internet, this is a uh, 1941. Uh, it's characterized because it has uh, slanted louvers here. And an earlier model looked very similar, but they were straight louvers. So it's a handsome little set for me. I like it. That's very nice. You can collect a lot of those. That's a nice thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's about then, eight, ten inches across, something like that. Yeah. And then Joe, uh, AB1YO, eat your, eat your heart out, man. There we go. Where did you get that? That's very nice. Very it, nice. Plugs, it lights up. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That's awesome. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. That's beautiful. Fluorescent yeah. background there, Bruce? Uh, no, it's actually black. It's a, let's see. It's painted, painted glass, silk screen on glass. And uh, it's, it's operated by, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what kind of light is inside of it. Look, look uh, maybe, at how, fl maybe fluorescent bulbs. Look, look at the artistry in that. Those, those two yeah. silver deco stripes just yeah. perfectly placed on those two curved sides. That's, that's a beautiful piece right there. That is. Wow. You need to get your shirt to light up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I enjoy these, these, uh, these meetings every two weeks because it challenges me to look around and see what I had. I had totally forgotten about it. It's been sitting on top of um, equipment here in the shack for 20 years. Oh my gosh. Wow. What a you know, and interestingly enough for anybody who chases that type of marketing stuff, you know, you'll pay far more in many cases for a sign that lights up that's in yep. great shape yep. than you would for the most desirable set that that manufacturer yes. ever made fully restored. It's an, well, because it's an interesting, the, yeah, interesting uh, yeah. situation. Yeah, it makes sense phenomenon. because the, there were fewer uh, repair shops than there were consumers. 
So they would have made fewer of those pieces. That's why they probably yes, be more that's true. Aware. That's true. Yeah. yeah, and to last this long in that good a shape, that's a beauty. No, that is that's gorgeous. Yeah, it's funny. Just mentioning about that is that uh, I went to a Barrett Jackson show, um, probably good, you know, almost ten years ago, and they have quite a quite a memorabilia or automobilia setup of people saying really high end stuff, and you wouldn't believe the prices like old neon signs for dealerships like Packard and so forth. We, just crazy money, more so than the car itself if you're to buy a, a nice Packard. Whoa. Just, you know, you're probably $25,000. You can find a Packard if you look very hard, you know, for, you know, maybe not the, the top line one, but it was remarkable, but absolutely beautiful Art Deco designs that, you know, just look phenomenal. You can only wish you could see it when it was on the street at the time at night. But I can appreciate that. So even that small, you know, that small sign is got is worth quite, quite a bit. And, Really nice uh, piece of history. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Roy, how are you tonight? I am doing well. I do not have a Philco to share, but it was an excellent presentation, David, and uh, really enjoying the show and tell. It was fun. Thank you. George, how are you tonight? What did George? Hi. My screen altered. Oh, George is gone. Somehow, Ken is lost, Ken is there now. <laughs> Well, we'll get back to you, George, if we can't find you. Where are you? There he is. Um, I didn't bring up a Philco here, but I have a quick story. 38.2 was the first um, radio I ever really uh, got into. And it was up in my uncle's bedroom up in the second floor of my grandfather's house. I remember hearing the BBC for the first time and hearing it live from London. Um, I was amazed that kind of started me off and then after that uh, I had a lot of uncles and aunts and as they got rid of all their old radios it always made it over to my folks house my poor folks the basement was full of all kinds of stuff so um, anyways that's that was kind of the the uh, story for Philco for me um, I, I've got Launch. a couple of Philco's and stuff but that was the that's what started me unfortunately in this uh, mm -hmm. obsession Thank you, George. Carl, how are you tonight? You look comfortable. Mr. Nord? Hello? Yes, Carl. Oh, okay, good. I guess I had the earphones plugged in. I guess that was uh, killing it. Uh, very, yes, I am comfortable. I'm, I'm, I'm leaning back in the chair, uh, which just makes my chin look fatter. I uh, very much enjoyed the uh, presentation and uh, what you have done is rekindle my interest of bucket list of adding a uh, hippo to my collection. Uh, I remember as a kid going to my a kid going to my parents house in Dedham Mass, grandparents house and they had a uh, had a hippo in the kitchen that was oh, always nice. of course, playing WBZ. Mm -hmm. So Every now and then I see them at a show and I think, oh, I had to grab it, I had to grab it, and I don't. Uh, but uh, now I'm going to go look at uh, eBay and decide how much I should make myself for. So <laughs> thank you very much. You thank know. you, Carl. Thank you. Let's see here. P Pear, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Anything additional to contribute other than your transitone for this evening? Well, <clears throat> just that. The reason that I remember the transitone so uh, vividly is that when I first started learning how to fix radios, uh, I quickly learned that many radios of that size would either fail because one of the series tubes would burn out, mm -hmm. um, and that would dis the distress the owner a lot or that the filter capacitors would go bad and, and the sound would be gargling. So <clears throat> let's say I went into a little store and there'd be a table model radio playing um, <clears throat> on a shelf behind the counter, but it would be gargling, uh, the sound would be gargling, and I would say, hey, for three bucks, I can fix that. There you go. <laughs> or in other cases, you know, um, somebody would tell me that their radio had suddenly stopped working and I would say, okay, I, I can deal with that for a small amount of money. 
and very often they were transitones or radios of that similar ilk. Mm. So that's my my reminiscence about a post business radio. opportunity presented by the transformalist sets. It's the American <laughs> way. I love it. <laughs> Let's see, Ken Silvestri, we haven't touched base with you this evening. Ken, how are you? Uh, okay, I should be unmuted. Um, I enjoy restoring Philco's. I've done quite a few over the years, and I did one recently that I really, I really like this little guy. And I think David Crew did one recently too, or at least he purchased one. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to uh, give you a little uh, presentation on it. It'll take about five minutes. Oh, if man. I can go right ahead, Ken. We can. We're doing yeah. all right for time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen here, and uh, let's see. How do I share the screen? Okay. It's, it's right about center up here. Share that. Okay. There we go. All right. This is a. Can you see it? Okay. Not yet. We're seeing your. Uh, we're seeing your window. Your window explorer. File Explorer window. Uh, There's a Philco slideshow comes up. I think you just have to get into the slideshow. Yeah, or he has to go into the right window to share. Uh, I'm not sure where that is. Did the, uh, did the, uh, do you double click? When you, did you have the window and there you go. Ta da. Thanks, okay. George. All right. This is a uh, Philco 37602. And it came from uh, Hopkinton, Mass. Uh, got it in the uh, state. Um, the owner, original owner, was a country doctor, and this was all original. Uh, so this is what the chassis looked like. Of course, I had taken the tubes out, but this is. Uh, it was pretty dirty. All original. Everything was still there. And that's the top side. And here's the bottom side. Busy, busy, busy. Yeah, it is. Isn't it? It's pretty packed. You don't see, you don't see many capacitors in here. Only a couple because they use the uh, bakelite blocks for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, God, but, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I could feel the frustration, David. That was no, good. No. I like that. <laughs> I, 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 I've subsequently learned a really neat trick for cleaning those out. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, you you oh. feel the pain. Yes. I, have a, I have a I have a good technique for them myself. Good. So, I want to hear it. You'll notice that uh, there's three Bakelite blocks. There's also this little bias cell uh, arrangement here. Um, can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and of course, that battery was long dead, and it's required to maintain a bias. So I had to devise an alternate method of doing that. And there's a lot of different approaches to it, uh, but I opted for a simple approach. So my next image will be the finished bottom side <laughs> and I used a coin cell holder uh, with a button uh -huh. cell and it was a little too wide uh -huh. so I added a, a stainless steel nut in there to take up the space <laughs> yeah. and it ended up uh, giving me the proper voltage and it, it's going to last 30 years or more uh, all the Bakelite blocks have been restuffed and nice. uh, they're pretty easy to for me to work on. I, I use a heat gun and I just melt That's out it. all, all That's the goop. trick right there. Yep. Uh, and then uh, you know unsolder the leads and, and clean them up. And then I'll put modern caps in there and uh, pot them with epoxy. Uh, the the wiring looks great, Ken. For for that vintage set was did you replace any or or some or the and no rubber wiring? Huh? Even though it was like 1937. There was no rubber wiring. It's all uh, uh, interesting cloth, cloth covered wire. So very nice. Can, can of, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I have a question about the volume. Uh, uh, normally, old volume controls can get they get scratchy or uh, or the on off switch, which is sometimes with the volume. Did you have any trouble with the old controls? Uh, it took a lot of cleaning. Okay. <laughs> what do you like use? The, what do you use to clean them? Deoxid. Okay. Uh, I'll spray them and work them, spray and work. Sometimes I'll let it sit overnight. And I'll, yeah. I'll spray them again. Uh, this one, as I recall, was very scratchy, but fortunately, the 
conductor path was still intact. So I was able to recover it. Um, it's still, you still hear a little bit of noise, but it's not bad at all. Yeah, yeah. But that is but, still the original part. Yeah, um, and to have that part with the Philco name on there is worth the scratchiness. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, it looks nice. Abs yeah, I totally agree. Most of the resistors have been replaced with either uh, uh, metal film or metal oxide uh, types. Um, and I try to get as close to the original value as possible. Uh, of course, there's a new Nicely line. Done. Board. Uh, everything else, uh, all the, again, all the wires are pretty much original. And, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty much it for that Great one. job. Thank Excellent. You. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Ken. Okay. And there's a lot of capacitors that should be on the bottom side that aren't because they were contained in this box, which is an early version of a coplate, I guess you'd call it. And it had all these values in it. Um, a lot of them were, were crap by that time. So I rebuilt this. Uh, I un unpotted it, took all the garbage out. It was not a fun job uh, connecting all the wires properly internally, so I, so I could put them in, back in the circuit properly. But uh, so this and probably yeah. this part probably took the most time of the whole restoration project. So uh, d was did the radio originally have all these capacitors in one? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, if you look on yours, you'll, you know, look at the wiring coming out of that box. It's got a whole mess of wires. So. Hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah. Hey, Ken, here's the question on this. Did you uh, use any uh, Ray Bintless references for this? Oh, yes. And then, um, no, so I, I've, I've worked on a few of these, uh, actually the earlier Philcos. And uh, the one that I'm working on now, it's an earlier 32, uh, 1932 vintage. It's a, uh, what is it, a 52, I think it is. And uh, in that one, I think there were five capacitors inside that. Uh, and I don't know why they went and did it, but they potted the thing inside the can itself. So it was actually relatively easy to get it out of the can. Um, but what I had to do is before I took anything apart was I had to trace the color codes. And if you didn't trace the color codes, you didn't have a clue where anything went. Did you find the same issue? Uh, honestly, I, I, I don't recall. Um, I use the schematic a lot for reference, and I think I trace them one by one by value. All right. The, the, re the reason I mentioned this is the, uh, the schematic, and the only one that I could find uh, gave, um, uh, what is it? Uh, part number well reference numbers on the schematic to the part number part list that uh, Philco had so there were no values anywhere on the schematic at all you had to go back and forth to find out what was what um, between each one and for example the uh, the multi capacitor can that you have there uh, they listed it as item number 23 and you had to scan all over to find number 23 all over the, uh, the schematic for it. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I know what you're talking about in the schematic. Yeah. would call out 23, but there'd also be a value. And at first I was confused because, oh, this is, a, this is part number 23. And then I'd find it again on another part of the schematic, and then I realized it was all contained in this, in this device. Yeah. Uh, similar to a, a, what a, a coplate would be. Yeah, and if, if I hadn't found the reference in Ray's book, uh, I would have known. And then subsequent to this, I found out that the model, I think 37, used the same part. So if I ever found a 37 to work on, I'd, I wouldn't have the problem again. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, next Very is, nice. uh, uh, that was that one. Yeah. Okay, this is, a, uh, this is cleaned up, obviously. Mm. Uh, the pilot light socket was just rotted away, so I, I built a new one, and I used an O-ring or a grommet as an insulator here. Uh, there mm. was a there was a projection with a hole in it, and it had, I believe it was a rubber sleeve in there before to uh, isolate it, and so I used the grommet, and that worked out really well. Um, it looks like factory. And that's the rear of it. Um, Beauty. 
I use reproduction uh, cloth covered wire for the uh, for the caps. Uh, this one I don't know why that's frayed. That got that got by me. <laughs> um, and there's the there's in the kit. Now what's nice about this is oh, the, yeah. the the fall burled finish. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's so mint, you know, it's the photo finish, but it's just mint. It's just, that's great. This yeah. one, uh, this one. Uh, one little uh, mark there down by the knob. Yeah, one little great. mark, yeah. But that's a beauty. That's, yeah. Yeah. Show that's the well flip worth keeping. Show them the other side, Ken. I will. <laughs> this, this is the original grill cloth, too. Oh, that's nice. Wow. Um, and the original dial. Here's the rear. Oh. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I, I, I just got one of these, and we put it on a Lazy Susan on my dining room table. See <laughs> both sides. It's, it's, it's uh, fantastic. That's a great nice job. It's great set any of way you look at it, it's a great looking It's a cone. beautiful piece. It's like that, beautiful. any way you look at it. I could be the ad man. I, I couldn't yeah. write it. <laughs> That's the original uh, wire antenna to, on, on the original spool. That's yeah, amazing. yeah, yeah. It looks like it was very well, you know, wherever he preserved it, you know, where it was sitting it was, it's a nice example. It was under a doctor's care for 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> I like wow. it. It's a top wood grain. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Really nice. That's a gorgeous. Great job. Oh, look at the label. Nice shape. Wow. Excellent. I wonder if we could call for prompt service. <laughs> Auburndale, Mass. Auburn Radio. I love it. They're not far from me, right down the street. Hey, Paul, this is Fred from New Jersey. 436. Um, I'm going to have to look for that number. Paul? Yeah. Yes, Fred. Yeah, this is Fred from New Jersey. Um, How are you? Good. Maybe Dave could give a talk to New Jersey Antique Radio Club on Philco. Oh, you I never know. A, Anytime. I, Anytime. I do, oh, I, do nice Philco, job, um, I do have a Philco uh, slant, slant front with selector buttons and everything. I don't know the model number, but... Um, I'm going to have to go because we most of us are without power. I just got it back, and I'm still putting things back together. So I'm going to have to scoop. But um, it's been great, and I'll try to be on the net tomorrow morning, okay? Take care, Fred. Good luck. See you, Fred. Thank, Thank you, Fred. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Well, Thanks. That, that's Thank that. Thank you for uh, sharing that. And uh, if we can Stay. go back. Who else do we – who else? Well, We've got 16 <laughs> participants here. Who, who else do we Let's have see. We not spoken yeah. to? Let's see if there's Arthur. And we have Gary. Yes, Gary. How are you tonight? Oh. Thank you, Ken. That was great, by the way. Just wanted to show you the radio. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's playing. Let's get a quick demo. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's very nice. Beautiful. It sounds great. That's Bravo, Ken. Exactly. Really nice. Really nice job. Thank you. Yeah. Get oh, yourself Harvey. a lazy Susan. You'll you'll just love <laughs> just, I'm telling you. <laughs> how, how hard is it to tune that thing with that just the one knob straight in? That's it, Ken, what it do is, you think? It's it, it has a vernier. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. Not, it's not direct drive. It's it's pretty easily tuned. Okay. Okay. Hey, Ken, where did you get the tuning? I'm sorry, the on off knob, because I'm sort of, uh, that's the one thing I really don't have that's legit to the it piece. Came with it. Really it good for you. Good for you. There are some good knob resources. There's a fellow down with the Delaware Valley Historical Radio Club. His name is Mike Costa. He's kind of involved in a lot of the Cootstown uh, activities. But he runs a little business, uh, Gobs of Knobs, Hold and he's Mr. Costa. Knob. Yeah, I, I'll look. I'll look. I might have his email somewhere for you. Uh, oh, that'd David. be great. Yeah. I also know another lady. Her name is Radio Pup. And interestingly enough, uh, I don't know if she makes them or collects them or does both. Yeah. But she's provided me with some knobs in the past. So there are oh. these people who kind of have these little niches, you know. That's yeah, Mike's yeah. a nice man, and he's he's very accommodating. So I'll, I, if I've I can find around. his address, I'll shoot well, it over. Thank you very much, because I've, I've gone to my usual, you know, my, the usual suspects, and this particular one, um, it's it's not a not a popular, not an, a brand, a radio that a lot, model that a lot of got, folks have, yeah, even the yeah. knobs for. So. That'd be great. I've had Thank very you. good luck with Radio Pop. She's been very good to work with. 
Yeah, she's a nice okay. lady. Uh, I Gary. was looking for a knob for a tusk, oh. and uh, she went <laughs> found one that was close enough. I think she made me a set for an admiral that I have, and it was most reasonable, so can't complain. Gary, how are you? Oh, good. <coughs> Would you have anything to put in the pot tonight for Philco night? Yes, I do. I had this, um, it's a Philco wireless safety set. And the really is, it's something that like an installer or a repairer would do. And then you're setting the push button. I think somebody is unmuted somewhere and it's. And during the spring, summer, and fall, Hiking sites. What's that? There we go. We just got to get Gary back. <laughs> okay. There he is. There you are, Gary. But this is a Philco wireless station setter. Um, it would be used for uh, like the repair guy or the stroller who came to your house. And uh, he would use this. This generates a sig the signal, all the signal at the radio station frequency, and the guy would use a signal from this to set the push buttons on the radio. Very now, cool. Oh, wow. case, That's maybe, fit. You remember at the time, maybe radio stations weren't on the air 24-7. That's true. They should That's maybe not the air. Or if it was a station that the customer wanted to get that came in at night, and during the day you couldn't get it, but the guy was setting it during the day. So, and you, you can see that some of the labels, uh, the, the, yes, the set, yes, there were some pre made labels available for it, others were just handwritten in. A DXer's dream, yeah, <laughs> uh -huh. that one I've ever seen. Very nice, Gary. Where did you come across that? If I may yeah, ask, that's... Well, um, I, I, I knew a friend of mine had one, and as you know, as, as what I think frequently happens, you can relate to. I had to have one too. Uh, and I found one on eBay. So Gary, nice. what's, that's terrific. Gary, what's the effect of range on it? I've never tried it. Um, you, you, you can see the uh, uh, the um, the knob is still curled up. <laughs> I'm not the knob. The power at the cord. <laughs> My brain was on gobs of knobs before. Excellent. Thank you, Gary. All right, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, gentlemen, I think we've successfully gone around the loop. And uh, David, thanks again. My pleasure. This was the, thanks I, for everybody thank for bringing their Philcos. I, I really, that, uh, I'm blown away by some of the stuff I've seen tonight. Fantastic. It's just great when we everybody's sharing some of these really neat finds. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, Dave, that was great. Really appreciate you taking the time for us. No, this, this, these are great meetings. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Dave. Well, John, I'm ready to sign off, everybody. Have a great All evening. All right, everybody, and we'll see what we'll figure out for the next two weeks around the, uh, around the 20th, I guess. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Right. Have Take a good care. night. Thank you for a great meeting. Thank Thanks, you. Dave. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.